Good morning. Our reading today is from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. The words of Nehemiah, son of Achalia. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his commands of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer that your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins that we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees and laws that you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction that you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants, who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favour in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. We're going to pray now for Ian who's speaking to us this morning. Let's just bow our heads, close our eyes. Father, thank you for your word, inspired by the breath of God. And Lord, we we just thank you that your word brings life and light and healing. All of the things that we need. And Father, I pray for Ian this morning as he opens this passage up for us and with us. Lord, I pray for clarity of communication. Father, I pray that the words that Ian brings won't just be words that we hear, but words that drop into the soil of our heart, that take root, that make us think and that help us to act. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Today we're beginning a brand new series from the book of Nehemiah that we've called Rebuilding. Now, at the start of every year, I ask the Lord for one word, really, for the year. I've done that for the last couple of years. And at the start of 2021, when I asked the Lord for a word, the word that God spoke to me was the word rebuild. Now, in many ways, that probably wasn't that surprising because last autumn we went through lockdown, which was a tricky time and it felt like we had to stop a lot of ordinary activities in life. And so in many ways, 2021 was always going to be a year to rebuild. I think what I didn't anticipate at the start of January is we would then go into another lockdown that would last a lot longer and actually be a lot harder, I think, for many of us to find our way through. And so it feels like the whole COVID experience has gone on maybe way, way longer than we anticipated. And I think we're only just realising that the impact of it has gone much, much deeper into our own personal hearts and lives and families, also our wider community and uh, the nation, um, but also um, it's hit us really hard as a church. And as we were reflecting on that, we were thinking, actually, if we take the Bible to be our guide, which I think is, is, is the right way to live life, then actually we need to come back to the Bible and say, what can we learn from the Bible about how we rebuild in this new season? 
And when we're reflecting on that, there's a book in the Bible which is all about rebuilding, and it's about God's people rebuilding when they're broken. And that's the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. Now, if I give a little bit of context around the book of Nehemiah, the way the Old Testament works is that God said to his people, um, if you follow me and obey my commandments, then I'll prosper you. Um, then I'll look after you, then I'll give you uh, the promised land, and the way that you prosper will cause other nations to say, what are they doing that's right, and how can we learn from them? And it was one of the ways that God would uh, rescue the whole world, because they would see the wisdom of following God's ways. But the flip side of that was that God said, if you depart from my ways, and if you choose your own wisdom, your own thoughts instead of my thoughts, then actually I won't be able to bless you. And you'll end up in a position of brokenness and you'll lose what I intended for you. And that sadly is what happens to Israel. And they end up losing the promised land. They end up being crushed by their enemies. And the temple that they'd set up, which was meant to be the place where God's presence dwelt with them, ended up in total devastation and ruins. And this happened in uh, about 400, between four and 500 years before the birth of Jesus. Jesus came to bring restoration because we believe in a God who does restore broken things. Um, But in 458 BC, a guy called Ezra rose up with a passion, a godly desire to let's start the process of rebuilding. And Ezra led a band of broken people who heard a cry from God to go and begin the process of rebuilding. Now, they went and begun that process in 458 BC. They actually got discouraged quite soon, and uh, they got intimidated by their enemies as well, maybe overwhelmed by the task, and so they stopped. But 13 years later, God sent a man called Nehemiah to restart the process of rebuilding. And I believe with all my heart in this season... God wants to grace us as his people, as his church community, as Restore Community Church. He wants to grace us with what we need to begin the process of rebuilding. And today we're going to look at our hearts because what maybe you will have noticed as Nehemiah chapter 1 was read is that Nehemiah's sense that he needs to go and do something about the situation for the city of Jerusalem. It starts with a broken heart. And so we're going to look today, our theme for today is a heart of compassion. And um, I think for many of us, we've experienced in this last season a broken heart in one way or another. Maybe that's because somebody that we've loved has literally died. Maybe several people Um, I know a number of us have had uh, people dear to us die and not be able to go to the funerals. uh, The deaths have happened in other nations, other parts of the world. That's really tough. For some of us, we've seen friendships break down, and that's really tough. For some of us, we've had to go through the process of being isolated, separated from the, the people that we love, the community that we would normally be with. And in so many different ways, there's been griefs and losses and attacks on our hearts. And if you were with us last Sunday when we gathered together at, at, at Davenant, I thought it was a, a beautiful time to be able to be together as God's people. But it felt like a lot of what God did as we were worshipping and uh, opening up to hear from the Holy Spirit and share words was actually there was, there was a, a lot of encouraging words but there was a lot of pain and grief. And I think as we regather, we realise maybe afresh all that we've lost in this last season and how painful it has been to walk through this last season. And I don't think that's a bad thing. We're just recognising the damage that's been done to our hearts. And if we're going to be a people who can rebuild, the first thing that we need to do is start to ask Jesus to rebuild our hearts to come and heal our hurts, because actually we can only bring comfort and hope and restoration to others when we've experienced that in our own lives. 
And one of the things I love about the book of Nehemiah, and I, I, I've, I've read the book of Nehemiah a number of times in the past, but it's only this time as I've looked at it and prayed over it, that I've realized for the first time that the name Nehemiah means the Lord comforts. And I love the fact that when God was beginning the process of rebuilding a broken people, he sent his comfort, literally sent his comfort to them. And in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 7, it says, it, it actually talks the process of rebuilding. It, it, literally, it says the healing of the walls of Jerusalem went on and the breaches began to be closed. And I think the process of rebuilding begins with us inviting God's comfort into our lives. And then we start to experience his healing. And it's out of that healing that we find the gaps being filled. We find God's Holy Spirit mortar um, uh, uh, piecing us back together. And then we can start to be a community that welcomes the healing of God. You know, last Sunday, I got quite emotional. I'm not normally um, the most emotional of people. And that's partly me. It's partly because I'm a bloke. We're like that, aren't we? Um, it's probably partly a lot about my makeup. But I got emotional, I think, because I realised how much grief I was carrying from the brokenness of the last season. This, this um, might be interesting news. I, I think it's quite shocking news. Um, sorry, I'm not going to disclose something about myself that I haven't told you before in case you're worried so you can relax. <sighs> um, the church in the Western world has taken an incredible knocking over this last season, over this last 18 months. And actually stats are starting to come through. Um, most churches now, as we start to regather, are regathering with between 30 and 60% of the number of people that they had pre-COVID. So most churches have been reduced. Now, I know people are still tuning in online and, and still are part of the church community. But most churches, when they regather, are regathering at between maybe a third and a half of the numbers that they were. And that's actually very painful. And it's very discouraging. It's also interesting that on the stats for in, in the US and the UK, over 50% of pastors have seriously considered quitting because they feel broken by the last 18 months. Now, I'm not going anywhere because God's spoken to me and I know what I'm called to. But in those moments when life is a challenge, we get hit by something that we never anticipated. We have to lean back into what has God spoken. And if we're going to begin the process of rebuilding, firstly, we've got to deal with our own grief. I was talking to a, a, a lovely, wise, um, godly man, older gentleman, on Monday. And I was recounting what happened on, on last Sunday. And he said two things to me that, that really, really helped me. Number one, he said, it's so healthy that you as a church family are choosing to grieve together. And he said, I know so many churches and they're just carrying on business as usual. It's like, here's our program, here's our reading for the week, let's just carry on and pretend that nothing's changed. And he said, I hear, I hear of very few churches that are taking the time just to stop, to worship Jesus, acknowledge the grief, the challenges, the pain and the losses, and inviting the Holy Spirit to start to bring healing and restoration. And that really encouraged me, because I thought everyone was like, we are. Second thing is, he said, is he said, if you've got grief and sorrow coming up, I think the wisest thing you can do is spend some time hurting at the cross. And I was really struck by the phrase, spend some time hurting at the cross. Because sometimes we want to skip over our pain and our hurt to healing. <laughs> So a preacher says, you could be healed in Jesus. We think, that's great, because I want to get rid of this stuff. So I'll jump from the, here I am, bruised and hurting, into, here I am, whole, ready to go. 
But you can't do that if you don't walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the, the pain and the sorrow and the reality of your loss. And when this guy offered to pray for me, I, I sat in my chair as he was praying over Zoom. Hey, who knew Jesus can still work over Zoom? Um, as we were praying over uh, Zoom, I sat there, I clenched my fist and I imagined I was holding a little cross. And I just hurt holding the cross. And I let some of my grief out as I hold the cross. And something happened. And as I was sitting there, I, I often get kind of um, pictures and senses of, of things, I guess images in my mind. As I was there, and I, I imagined I was holding a cross, but it felt so real. And I just let myself hurt at the cross. Carried on the process of some of the stuff that was stirred last Sunday. And as I was sitting there doing it, I was holding a small cross. And yet suddenly I felt I was inside a big cross. And I can't quite explain it, but it's like the pain I was carrying went in to what Jesus carried on the cross. And in that moment, it was like the pain started to be drawn out of me and went into a safe place where it could be dealt with. And I felt really vulnerable last um, Monday morning. So I was kind of protecting myself at work because I, I thought I just wanted to sit down and cry. But after that happened, it was like all the grief went. Because as Isaiah 53 says, he carries all of our griefs and our sorrows. But to get there, I had to be willing to sit in my grief at the cross. And for some of us, if we're going to have hearts that are able to begin the process of rebuilding, and we know that, that God isn't interested in our outer appearance, you know, I've got the, the set behind me. I kind of feel like I, I should be wearing a Bob the Builder hat. And you can all <laughs> sing along to the theme song, Bob the Builder, can we fix it? And you shout back, yes, we can. Because um, we can rebuild in the strength of Jesus. But God actually isn't interested in our outer appearance. We know that, says that a number of times in the Bible in one way or another. He's interested in our hearts. And so if we're going to rebuild, firstly, We've got to make room and space for heart healing. And I would say one bit of wisdom for the autumn season. Spend some time. Find whatever space you need, whatever friend you need, whatever relationships you need. Find a safe place where you can grieve at the cross. And invite the Holy Spirit to bring comfort because the Lord wants to send comfort that will bring healing. I love the fact that it talks about healing the walls of Jerusalem and, and the word Jerusalem means city of peace, city of shalom, city of wholeness. And as we grieve at the cross, Jesus is able to bring healing to us. That means re, we recapture, we rebuild we rediscover the world of wholeness and healing, and then God can speak. And so I think our first step is in rebuilding is, is let's invite Jesus into the healing of our hearts. And when I say the healing of our hearts as well, that's a work that needs to happen in us individually, but it's also a, a work that needs to happen in us corporately. One of the things you'll discover as we work through the book of Nehemiah is it's a community that work together. In the West, we've, we've become very individual in our outlook. Actually, in the Bible, I think the English language doesn't always help us on this. Um, in the Bible, it often talks about you, but most of the time when it talks about you, it's a plural you, it's not an individual you. And so not only do we need to invite the Holy Spirit into our individual healing, we actually need to invite the Holy Spirit into the heart of restore. And so if you have fractured relationships, if you have fractured friendships, if that's part of the outworking of the last 18 months, as you grieve at the cross and find your own healing, can you go and put the relationship right? Can you go and reconnect into the heart of restore so that together as God's people, 
we experience that wholeness, that shalom of God again, so then we can begin to offer that and release that and share that to others. So it all starts with our heart. Let's be brave enough. Let's be bold enough. Let's prioritize it enough. You know, there's so much stuff, isn't there, these days on, on healthy diets for your heart and all of that sort of thing. We know that a cheerful heart is good medicine. Actually, um, Christians, this is a medical statistic, but a follower of Jesus statistically lives longer than someone who doesn't follow Jesus. Why? Because of our heart health. And that's not just about our diet, although often being a follower of Jesus means that we deal with our addictions and some of the things that aren't good for life. But actually, a follower of Jesus lives longer because we resolve our heart issues. And because a cheerful heart is good medicine, actually, our life expectancy goes up because of it. But you need to deal with your heart issues to do it. So let's deal with our heart issues as individuals, but let's also do it as a church. So Nehemiah starts carrying the heart of God, which is why God's able to use him. He then asks for a report. His brother goes and, uh, and visits Jerusalem, and he asks him how it's going in Jerusalem. And his brother brings back a report and says this. He says, um, well, he, he says, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates burned with fire. So the report is quite stark and a long, long way away from God's best. Maybe for some of us right now, how we're feeling is quite stark, if we're honest, and a long, long way away from God's best. The good news, comfort is coming. Help is coming. Healing is com coming. The very next verse, we see Nehemiah's response to the situation. It says in verse four, now it came about when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And God was able to use Nehemiah because he had a heart that was available. And in those moments when Nehemiah heard the report of what was happening in Jerusalem, he caught God's heart. And that was the key for beginning the process of rebuilding. I love there's a Hillsong song, I think it's a Hillsong song, the song Hosanna. And I love that because later on as it builds and goes into the refrain or whatever you call it, you see I'm really musical. Um, it says, heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you've loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause. As I go from earth to eternity. And I love that. But it's interesting, it starts, heal my heart and make it clean. Because we can't catch God's heart for restoration unless we first experienced his healing. Because otherwise all we'll feel is our pain and our pain will be connected to our hurt and not necessarily reflecting God's heart. So first we need to experience the healing and the making it clean. This is a contemporary worship song with good theology. <laughs> Celebrate it. Then it says, there's a lot in that statement, I've just realised, I've disclosed. Then it goes on, break my heart with what breaks yours. And one of the things that I think we need to recognise is that this last season will have exposed some weaknesses for us. In Matthew's Gospel, when uh, Jesus takes away the disciples and gives them the principles for what it is to live as a follower of Jesus, commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount. At the end, he finishes it with a story, and it's about two builders, and they both build a house. One builds on the rock, and one builds on the sand, and a storm comes. One house stands, one house falls. And Jesus says, those that have heard my word and put it into practice have a house that stands. That's like building on the rock. The other ones, their house has fallen. 
Let's be honest and brave and bold and vulnerable. For some of us, our house hasn't stood in the last 18 months. What we thought was going to hold us up hasn't. The truth is, we must have been building in some way on sand rather than rock. And that may be a shock, but actually there's an opportunity in that to learn and as we rebuild, to rebuild on rock rather than sand. And, and something that I'm carrying and very aware of is as a church, as Restore, we haven't withstood this last season brilliantly. No church has from the stats, but the reality is we haven't either. And when we gathered together last Sunday and I stood there in front of everyone, I knew that we were a remnant. I knew that not everyone had made it through the last season. And we have to learn something from that as a church because it also says in some ways as a church, we've built on sand instead of rock. And I think we need to be brave enough to reflect on where the last 18 months shows us where we've fallen short as individuals but also as a church community, because if we face the reality of that, we can choose to build in a different way. Because I keep telling myself, this is a once in a lifetime thing. Pandemics only happen once in a lifetime. This might be a really difficult season to, to lead through. Not many people have to lead an organization or a church. I, I take my hat off to you. If my Bob the Builder hat, that I'm imaginary one that I'm wearing, I take, it, take my hat off to every teacher, every head. I have no idea how you're still surviving. Some of our frontline NHS workers, I've no idea how you've made it through this last season. I think in many ways that's, that's probably been true of anybody in leadership. Some of our businesses, professions have been hit really hard. Our churches have as well. There's an opportunity to learn from that. So we build differently so that should a storm come, because I say it's a once in a lifetime thing, but actually we don't know. Hopefully it won't happen again soon, but it might do. We can't do anything about the storm, but we can do something about our foundations. And as we look through the book of Nehemiah, I want us really to think about our foundations. And the few things that's, that's really struck me about this, so particularly as we're talking about our hearts and compassion, um, indulge me for a few minutes where I share a couple of thoughts. I think as a culture, we've really missed what love really is. Because we use the word love as a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling. But actually, when we come back to loving the Jesus way, the word that's used for Jesus loving us, for God so loved the world, is not a warm, fuzzy feeling. It's the word agape which is a self-sacrificing, laying down of life commitment. And we have lots of marriages these days that break down, and they break down because the warm, fuzzy feeling disappears. Well, let me tell you, that's life. That happens. What holds a marriage together is a self-sacrificing willingness to lay down my life to serve someone else that I made a commitment to. When I got married with uh, Chris, I, I think the most fantastic moment of my life was seeing Chris walk down the aisle to me. And a number of people, I'll cry, but a number of people said um, the best thing about our wedding was my face when I saw Chris start to walk down the aisle. Um, because I've never felt any more in love as I did in that moment. Over the last 26 years, we've had to face a lot of other stuff. What's got us there hasn't been that feeling on that one day in the one moment. It's the fact that from that, in the presence of God, I made a commitment for better, for worse, in sickness, in health, in ri for richer or poorer. And let's be honest, most of us, when we say that, we mean three out of the six. For better, for richer, 
in health. When it's in sickness, when it's poverty, when we're challenged, it's more of an issue. It's then that I need to discover that love is a commitment. It's not a warm, fuzzy feeling. We can be a part of a church and love the Holy Spirit moment where I get a warm, fuzzy feeling. That warm, fuzzy feeling isn't going to get me through a storm. Understanding that Jesus made a commitment and laid down my, his life for me and that I respond by, in the tough times, surrendering my life over and over again to Jesus, that's what brings you through a storm. This whole topic today is, is a heart of compassion. Compassion isn't a soft word. It's a strong word. It actually literally means with passion. So it's not a warm fuzzy, oh, there, there, it'll be a bit better. It's a deep driving to something needs to change. Every time in the Gospels, it talks about Jesus being filled with compassion. It prefaces Jesus taking action. It's a stirring that says something has to change. Nehemiah, his heart is broken when he hears about Jerusalem. It evokes a stirring that says something has to change. So when Jesus feels compassion, he then feeds a hungry crowd. When Jesus feels compassion, he steps over a cultural boundary and reaches out and touches a leper when he never should have done it. The stirring of compassion enables Jesus to step over something. And you see, we reduce com compassion to, I need to be nice to everyone. That isn't compassion. That's just being nice to someone. Compassion is, I allow myself to be stirred in the depths of who I am about a situation or a circumstance or somebody's life, and I respond to say, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to make a change. And I think, again, we've reduced, if we reduce love to a warm, fuzzy feeling, we've reduced compassion to being nice to everyone. But our definition of nice needs to come back in, line, in alignment with Jesus. Because what does it mean for Jesus to be nice to someone? Most of the time, we think about the leper story. He reaches out and puts his arm around the, the, the wounded and the hurting, whatever else. But then in Mark chapter 10, we read the story of the rich young ruler. And this guy comes to Jesus and he says, teacher, good teacher, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, what does the Bible say? And he gives all the right answers. And we think, wow, fantastic. Jesus would put his arm around him and say, come and follow me. It then says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Maybe we're not in surprise territory yet. That's how I'd expect Jesus to respond. What does Jesus say next? He says, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And he hits the stronghold in the guy's life. And the guy walks away. Now, our contemporary culture would say easily, maybe, a follower of Jesus needs to be nice to someone but actually loving someone the Jesus way sometimes means challenging an issue that is out of line. And Jesus loved the rich young ruler by being hard on him and being tough on him. He wasn't just nice. And next year, one of the things I want us to do is, is read right the way through, teach right the way through a gospel and see how Jesus really lived. Because we, we tend to have the warm and friendly, nice and cuddly Jesus. And Jesus is love. So it's not like he isn't like that. But sometimes we need things pointing out in our lives because it's not loving to leave us like it. And in the last year, some of us, our house hasn't stood because of what we've believed, how we've acted and how we've lived. A simple thing would be to say to one another, there, there. Don't worry, I'll help you rebuild. But actually, if it's exposed things that we need to get rid of, maybe attitudes that were under the surface, maybe um, 
not really living a Jesus-style lifestyle, maybe believing truths that aren't reality, actually it's more loving to say, what has that exposed? What do you think that represents? Do you think there's something there we need to change? Now, I don't want us to be a judgmental community, so I don't want us to be looking for faults in one another that we can point out, because Jesus loved, looked at him and loved him. But sometimes love means that we have to face hard truths and hard realities. I would really want us as God's people in this season to face the hard truths and deal with those issues because that's how we will then build successfully. I know nothing about building. I'm rubbish at DIY. Please don't invite me to come and decorate your house or put up your shelf or whatever because it's not that I'm unwilling, but it won't bless you. Um, what I do understand, though, is that digging foundations is the hardest bit of work. But if you dig the foundations deep enough and well enough, the rest of the building stands tall. Wouldn't it be great if in this season we let Jesus dig really deep in us, both as individuals and as a community, maybe face some really hard questions about our own discipleship, but then lay really good foundations that God's able to build on. Nehemiah starts his response, so I'm uh, finished soon. I know I've spoken for long enough, but he, he starts in prayer. And his prayer is fantastic, actually. There's uh, six things that he prays um, between uh, verse 5 and verse 11. Number one, he focuses on God's greatness. If we're going to rebuild, we need to see the bigness of God, not just the debris. And Nehemiah starts by looking at the bigness of God. Do you know, Jesus hasn't changed in the last 18 months. Our circumstances have, but Jesus hasn't. So we need to start by reminding ourselves again of the goodness of God, because then we find faith rises. Second thing he does is he surrenders as God's servant. Um, I love the fact that in uh, six verses, five of the six, he says, your servant, your servant, your servant, your servant. Followers of Jesus are servants of God. The best ability any of us can ever have is availability, which is yielding ourselves and saying, here I am, God. Do you know, we've got to rebuild in this next season. I'm saying, here I am, God. What do you want me to do? And I'm surrendering as a servant. Next thing he does is he confesses his sin. So he deals with what I've just been talking about. Where have I got it wrong? Where are my foundations not good? Because we can't correct someone else's life before we've been willing to have Jesus correct our life. You can't put into someone else what you haven't got in your own life. Jesus teaches it in the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't he? He says, you can't take a speck out of your brother's eye if you've got a log in your own life. So you have to start with owning your own sin. So Nehemiah doesn't say, oh, how wicked we've been as a nation. Oh, how wicked God's people have been. But it's OK, I'm coming to the rescue. Nehemiah sees the nation's sin mirrored in his own heart. And he deals with his own heart. That's why, that's why we've got to get it the right way around and start with our own hearts if we're going to begin the process of rebuilding. Then he reminds God of God's word. Not his dreams for rebuilding, but God's word. And he quotes, I love this, from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. He mirrors the sentiments of that verse. We, it's a famous verse. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin and I will heal their land. We know that verse probably, we've heard it so many times in prayer meetings. Do you know that verse God spoke when the first temple was dedicated. And as Nehemiah begins the process of seeing the temple rebuilt, he reminds God that God's promised that if his people come back in repentance, in humility, if they own their failings, if they own their sin, then God can pour out his grace. 
So he takes the truth from God's word and he starts to claim it and pray it and, uh, and believe it and prophesy it into the situation. Then he reminds God, I love this as well, he reminds God that they're his people. Um, there's, a, there's a lovely bit in Exodus where um, God's not very happy with the nation of Israel and he talks to Moses and, and God, says, God says to Moses, I lo- love it, it's really, really, there's some great com- comedy moments in the Bible if you look at it close enough. Um, but God says to Moses, look what your people have done. And Moses turns and replies to God and says, they're your people. And they kind of, Moses is like, they're not mine. And God's like, they're not mine. And they kind of have this little debate. But Moses reminds God that they're his people and it's his glory that's at stake. And God retakes ownership of the people. And for some of us, we need to retake ownership of being the people of God. Do you know what winds me up? You want to wind up Ian up? I feel like I'm being very honest today, but you want to wind Ian up. Talk about the church should do it. There's no such thing as the church as an organisation or an institution. The church is a community of believers. So if the church should do it, you should do it because you're the church. But quite often we dump responsibility onto someone else. No, restore should have done that. Or should have done that. If you're watching this, you're a part of restore. And we need to retake that sense of ownership because it's together that we will build a different way. It's together that we'll see God work. And Nehemiah recognizes that he's part of that community and embraces being a part of that community. Some people, let me tell you, some people have struggled to make it through the last 18 months because they never joined a community of God's people. They went to an event. Church is never meant to be an event. It's meant to be a life shared, a body. And if you're not joined to the community, guess what happens when a crisis hits? You've got nobody to rely on, nobody to ask to pray for you, nobody to be alongside you because we're called to be a community of people. And Nehemiah retakes that sense of being part of the people of God. And then from that place, he pleads for God to bring change. Wouldn't it be amazing if in this season, as we move forward, we capture the heart of Nehemiah, and then we offer ourselves to God as his servants and say, God, use me to rebuild. And what I love, I'll finish this, but verse 11, it finishes with, now I was cupbearer to the king. And God is about to move because somebody has got hold of his heart, has offered themselves, made themselves available to God and has prayed and it triggers a move of God. Wouldn't it be amazing if right here, right now, today, We offered our hearts to God again. We asked him to bring healing where we need healing. We gave God permission to let us hurt at the cross. But then also out of that process of healing, we say, God, here I am. I'm part of your people. I'm available. I'm willing. Here I am. God, will you use me to build differently so we can be part of a community that really does reflect your glory We can be a body of Christ that really does look like Jesus. And we can model to the world the wisdom of God as we live a different way. Let's pray. I feel two things as I um, start to lead us in prayer. Number one, I, I think many of us, if not most of us, Maybe all of us are going to need to spend some time in this season hurting at the cross. And I want to encourage you, maybe you can do it now. Maybe this is something you need to start now, to do now, but actually may, maybe find some other time in the next week or two. In this moment, as we're in the presence of God and his Holy Spirit's at work, Maybe in your mind, you just want to start naming some of your griefs and sorrows and pains. Just 
start to own them, start to acknowledge them. Let's not hide them. Let's not try and cover them up. Sweep them under the carpet. Let's be brave enough to own them. Maybe as you're owning them, just imagine yourself holding a little cross. Lord Jesus, we know that if we are going to be people that you can use to heal our community, we need first to experience that healing in our lives. And so, Lord, right here, right now, I say I'm willing to hurt at the cross. And Lord, I know that I hurt, but rather than take my hurt to other people, or splurge it out over the family. I choose to bring it to you and hold it at the cross. And Lord, as I bring my hurt to the cross, Lord, thank you that you weep with me. Thank you, you bled on the cross because you were cut. Thank you that where I'm cut, I can bleed with you. I can weep with you. I can feel isolated with you. I can feel rejected with you. I can feel an outcast with you. Thank you that you know and you understand. Now, Lord, I pray for us as a church community. Lord, will you heal our hearts and make us clean? Will you heal our hearts and make us clean? And Father, I pray in this season, Lord, will you lead us, will you help us to cooperate with your Holy Spirit to see heart restoration? And at the same time, will you start to give us the gift of being able to share your heart? To know our hearts being broken with the things that break yours. To see where you're wanting us, where you're stirring us to be part of the process of rebuilding. Father, I pray over the coming weeks as we look at the different elements in the story of Nehemiah. Lord, I pray that we'll know where you're calling us to begin that process of rebuilding the community of God's people. Lord, I pray your blessing on each and every one of us. I pray your um, closeness. I pray your love, your genuinely agape, total commitment, whole life love. Pray that over us as a church community, as a church family. In Jesus' name. Amen.